This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name is Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, a spotlight on successful outcomes and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver a highly effective, customized, and engaging learning experience for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hi there, I'm Ladek. This episode is part of a live real-time series that I recorded at the 2022 EDUCAUSE conference in Denver, Colorado. In this conversation, I speak with Peter Mosinskis, Kate Miffitt, and Mike Pronvenost from California State University about the success and challenges of their free device program for creating digital equity. And just a quick reminder, you can make sure to never miss an episode of the podcast by subscribing at elearnmagazine.com. Now, I give you Mike, Peter, and Kate. We're back here live from EDUCAUSE. I'm Lanigan. I'm here with three specialists. This is fantastic. I think we can see everyone. Chris, can you take down the minute? There we are. So, um, from right, Mike Corbinos. That's right. Did I get that correct? Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm going to butcher his name. Peter Mosinski. Perfect. All right. And Kate. And are you all three from the CSU system? So, all three California state We're here to talk about it. Digital access, digital equity, through the lens of the provision of devices to students. And I want to throw the I want to throw the data point on the table to get started with is forty thousand devices. Is that what we're yeah, at right yeah, now? pretty close. Yeah, among fourteen, we started with fourteen campuses initially year one, and we put about twenty nine thousand that first year, and then since then we've gotten to pretty close to 40,000 devices, and now we're about 16 campuses. 60 campuses. 16. 16, yeah. 16. Okay. So, maybe, like, what's the genesis of this digital access program? Like, you know, at, what, at, at some point, either a group of people got together, or one person had a great idea, or whatever, and what, what was the, what's the genesis of saying, let's get devices out? Well, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. So. Digital equity has been such an important issue for the CSU overall. I think our commitment to finding better ways to serve students I think was really brought to light through the pandemic. Uh, and uh, as we had to pivot to figure out how can we really keep students connected and how do we do that? And so the great thing about it is we're a big system, 23 campuses, we serve uh, 480,000 of our students. And it's bigger than some people. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, quite honestly, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, so to, to, to try to do something to really help students in as much of a universal way as we could, I think we had some really excellent uh, uh, executive sponsorship and, and support of the campuses, our 23 campuses, that, uh, that uh, again, that subset of campuses that was really interested in tackling that issue at that time. And so that, that was kind of the, uh, to the nutshell of where we grew up from. There, there have been efforts to address digital equity and the digital divide uh, over the years uh, that our campuses have tried really hard to, to uh, enable access. And I think the pandemic really gave us a great opportunity to, to try to do things in a bit of a different way. So how, how long has this been? Sorry, go ahead. I'll do that. I was going to say, I mean, 
Penn State was at about 100 there. That's a, that's a really big deal. Yeah, and that number might not be no device, but shared device, so it's smart. Yeah, that's a really good I'm sorry, I didn't, maybe I missed it. So is this only been around for two years now, or when 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 did it actually start, the device? Yeah, yeah. So C Success started uh, June of last year. Oh my gosh! Yeah, so, so only last year. Yeah, yeah. So it's been quite a runway to get to this point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, as Kate had mentioned, you know, the genesis of the program started from our executive leadership at CSU, really focused on how do we pro how do we close the digital divide by providing technology to students and all the access to it. Secondarily, how do we how do faculty leverage technology in the classroom to do new things that they weren't capable of doing before students came with that level of technology? So is this like, I mean, maybe I'm going out of line. Does this speak to device as a right? You know, like, so is, is there a piece in there where at least the California state system has said, we recognize that, you know, in order to actually have an a equitable path with anybody else, you've got to have one of these devices. Is that like... Written somewhere, or is that is there is there a movement in that direction? I, I yeah yeah. So uh, I, I think I think what we're what we're really trying to do is make sure that all students have access, equitable access to technology as a whole, right? So uh, similar to the, the survey that Kate's talking about, we also uh, you know Fresno initially started a program called Discovery, which was similar, and that was started in 2014. The idea behind that was if you can provide a um, similar level of device to all students, how does that change what happens in the classroom? And there was some really interesting findings from that. What we're really trying to figure out is when, when we survey students and say, do you have access to technology? That could mean anything, right? They, they might say, well, I have access to a 10-year-old desktop at home, right? So how do we provide a similar device to all students uh, going forward so that students feel they have what they need to succeed, and our faculty feel comfortable knowing you know, a student comes to my class, they have X, Y, or Z device. And they can teach basically. Has your has your um, presentation already happened? Like, did you know? No, it's yeah. yeah our presentation is coming up this uh, Friday at uh, it's nine o'clock on Friday. Okay, but, so you haven't had feedback. What I was trying to get is you haven't had feedback on what you're going to be presenting. Go ahead. Yeah. We presented it internally, so we conducted an evaluation. Shared it from the internal system. What's the feedback getting from the internal system? What I'm really interested in, like where I'm going with this is, what was really successful? What failed? What was unexpected? some of the most significant challenges like rolling out a device to go to a rally, right? I mean, is it selecting the device? Is it just getting it to them? Is it replacing the ones that get broken? Like, what, what are what are the biggest challenges that you've found in the program? Can we say all of that? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Well, I, yeah, I think the, the uh, and I think to what Kaylee mentioned around the awareness of the program, there's some really interesting things that came out of the the assessment and uh, some of that anecdotal feedback that we received. 
uh, just about students being aware uh, that the program was there. And we know campuses went through a lot of effort to try to publicize this through multiple channels. And, and uh, it's still, you know, students are sometimes still challenged to, I think, get the right information through the right kinds of channels and to really feel comfortable around what it is that they're receiving and the benefits that they're getting. Uh, I think that was another thing that was maybe uh, uncovered a little bit as well. But maybe there is a sense of students not really being sure of what they're getting. And they feel, especially for students that may not have had access to the device previously, they feel comfortable that, that they can engage with this device, they can use it in the way that that uh, they want and that, that it support their academic experience and, and that they won't they won't be held liable if something we to drop it and it breaks, you know, especially for uh, a, a lot of our students that, that uh, are challenged to have access to devices. You know, that having access to devices can be a real enabler, but it can also be a real problem if, uh, yeah, if, if, if they can't use the device where they, they feel like they have to treat it in a, in a certain way uh, so that uh, they won't be uh, able to challenge the other ways. Yeah, this really is interesting uh, because it's going to, I think there's a Venn diagram. I'm, I'm not sure dovetailing is the right word there. I don't know my metaphors very well. But um, I think it's a gentleman named Michael Kubel and Hank Plant that we're learning with as well. They're both from Team Mobile and they're going to be talking about digital equity. So equity, this type of same type of equity. But one of the interesting kind of three conversations I had with them, like I was I'm talking with you guys, is the device given to a person who didn't have access before, it's kind of, it, it's one of those holy grail moments where it's like, what is it? Do I even know what to do? So I find it really interesting that you're now getting really hard data on that particular issue. Do you see like a massive update? Like, I mean, I give an iPad to my eight-year-old and she's a whiz, right? And so I'm just wondering, do, do we see that same kind of thing happening? You know, like that hockey stick access, like, uh, understanding. Yeah, yeah, so what's really interesting is, uh, especially Fresno has some really good data around, the present state has some good data about this, you know, in our program about this, particularly because they have several years with the data on their training. But what we didn't realize initially, even in Fresno, is that when you hand a device to a student, they may say they know how to use that device. But, I'm going to lie to you too to get an idea. Yeah, to exactly, to right? <laughs> exactly, whatever it takes, right? But then when they actually get into the classroom, they may not really understand how to utilize that for their, their class or how to use that for productivity or use, utilize that at home, right? So there was a, what we realized, we've got to build a training for students when they pick up the device. Um, and a lot of the students that even had access to technology before, maybe they had a different device. We've had an Android and they get an iPad. It might be a different training experience on that too. So what we try to do is incorporate that when they pick up the device, they go through training, it's just a part of the process when you get the device. So everybody gets that training, so you don't feel like, why am I, you know, why am I afraid to ask those questions? We kind of lower the playing field, so everybody has an opportunity to do that. The other way we do that is we have uh, other students that uh, that do peer peer training. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and believe it or not, in campuses that utilize that, they have a higher engagement rate among students than going to their their health desk staff. Right, sure. health desk staff. Yeah. I was just going to say, I feel like. Do you find that in the student population? Like, if you see someone struggling, they're going to reach out, or there's that peer-to-peer -peer learning in like real time. Of hey, let me show you how to do it. Or even would you say even within the beneficiary population, they, have they kind of create support groups and those kinds of things? Well? Yeah, I think they have a go-to. They have their go-to friends and peers that that are willing to answer questions. Similar to the survey, the survey actually asked this question: How do you get your technology support? vast majority of students will also do it through um, YouTube or social media. Yeah, so they, they've they learned to go online. I think, uh, I'm trying to recall the stats on it. I don't know, do, something like 35% of students uh, utilize social media to get their technology help. Um, and then, I guess I'm blanking on the, the additional uh, components of that. But that, that seemed to be the majority followed by some on-campus training um, and, and trying to troubleshoot themselves. Well, it's really interesting. I'd love to hear you just kind of grouping as well. It's like every device in the world can do that. And everybody throws away immediately, right? Like, I'm as guilty as anybody else. 
And we have we entered the age of the hacker, right? Where it's, look, I'm going to, I've, I've been making this argument on the podcast for a very long time now, where we like to think of online education, we like to think of online learning as learning management systems and, you know, these SISs and devices. And I'm like, the Google search is the most important. Like that, because we have immediate problems, we get immediate solutions, right? And we like to call it microgramming and microgramming and some of the things, but really, we've been doing it forever. That was just how they said that. Um, any like any aha moments that came out of the survey or that have come out of the program thus far where it's like we didn't expect that to happen or it was a really interesting piece of data? So we asked a question around um, the whole list of like course activities that students use to learn things like accessing libraries, um, checking out. And the top two, they were all again very like highly an opportunity that uh, we're also looking to, to try to continue to tap into uh, is really creating those connections. So helping students really on a, a, a per program or per discipline basis and faculty in those disciplines also understand what are the opportunities that are available with that platform to increase engagement, to make their academic experience better, uh, you know, scoring teaching and learning, mm -hmm. or other things that are related to the, the academic experience. So, everybody's going to want to know this. What's the request? Like, you know, you've given out some 40,000 devices. Is it lower than you thought? Is it higher than you thought? Is it? It's it's less. Uh, it's less than 1%. Yeah, surprising. It, we, there's some other um, industry articles that talk about this, and I was a little surprised. That also lines up with what they've seen. Usually when I read some of those, it was like, I don't know about that, right? But part of that, I, I do think, though, um, so I will say you know, some of our campus, you know, they're including cases and things like that to make sure that the device is being dropped. But on top of that, many students, I mean, this is their, their first device, right? They're really taking taking care of that say, it's like it's like you know your, your your first big you know if, if you've been gifted this special thing like you, you, you kind of treat it real special exactly well, exactly right? you know what as for one of the find you know one of the aha moments uh, was a lot of stuff that occurs on campus right you send emails out email announcements well we found a lot of students obviously you know if they don't have access to a device aren't checking their email right so You'd say, how come I sent out three emails? I don't know why students don't pick them up, right? So sure, that's sure. one of the reasons we also say we need to integrate this into like orientation, something like that, where we know that they're there and they have an opportunity to hear about what it is. Because a lot of people are skeptical too, right? Like, 
how many times have you told in your email that you have a you're getting a free device, you're getting something free, right? I mean, you just won a hundred dollars, right? Yeah, you're you're gonna go straight to spam or you're gonna delete it because yeah. you think it's fake. So a lot of students want to know what's the catch, right? And so you have to take the time to explain to them that, that that's the whole point of the program. Is there a give back? So do they get the device for a certain amount of time, and then once it's completed, they agree to give it back? Is there an end of life for the device? Is there, you know, hey, you're failing out, so you got to get the device back? Do you have to meet some criteria or anything like that? So when the, uh, the program has actually undergone some changes. So when uh, the program originally launched, uh, the device distribution was really focused on uh, getting devices in the hands of first-time freshmen. And it was that iPad bundle that, that were, uh, was offered to those students. In our early iteration, we've actually made them back. So it's, it's now a multi platform uh, model. And uh, with regards to uh, student access, we've really made it possible for campuses to evaluate what are the needs of students on those campuses and to try to tune that. Sort of balance the, the equation or equations related to getting access to student, uh, those devices to students. So, what what kind of devices do, uh, do students need? In, maybe even in specific disciplines. How long do they need those devices? Uh, what kinds of uh, applications might need to exist on those devices? Uh, all of those discussions now are, are really being managed in, in somewhat different ways uh, uh, at our campuses and we're. We're glad to see a really broad range of flexibility for different uh, students. So, what's your, like? Give me a sense of what does school year 2020, 2024 look like? So, you've the program is going. Actually, before you answer that, you got 24 campuses. How come only 16 are taking a hundred? Like, what's what is a what is a part of the network need to do to say yes? They have to raise their hand and say yes, we want to be a part of it and. Like, why wouldn't it just get activated for all, all of the, the system? I want to sure. it a little bit. Yeah, I'm, happy, I'm happy to chat with you as well. Happy, so. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do think that there's, uh, we're trying to, you know, campuses want to identify, okay, going forward, what does this look like, right? Because the, the minute you start this, right, you know, let's say, for example, you, you roll in freshman class and sophomore class, right? You need to identify funding sources going forward. You need to identify support services that are going to support those devices. And so, um, you know, it's like any sort of grassroots effort, right? We start with a small number of campuses and then eventually they become champions and then they grow from there. And, um, you know, uh, again, one of our champion campuses now is Fresno State, but they started with just like 1,200 students initially and 40 faculty that wanted to say, okay, I'll allow this in my class. And now it's the whole campus. So. It, I do think that's a better approach than just saying we're going to mandate across the whole system. We want to we want some skin in the game. Yeah, and buy, we want yeah, people buy. To have some ownership. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I do think that's also what's been helpful about the changes is campuses get that opportunity to say, here's what that looks like on my campus, and here's how we can do that in some unique way. Is there is there buy-in from Apple on the back end in any way? Is it all iPads, or is there is there you know vendor support? Is there you know like I don't know where the funding is really like. If I were one of these, I'd be like, hey, look, I want people to get my device because then they're going to be lifetime buyers and those kinds of things. Is there, and I don't mean that in a nefarious way at all. It's a very tried and true thing as well. Does that, does that happen? I mean, yeah, I think we've had really good support from what I think is becoming an ecosystem. So, you know, we started out the program uh, with the support of Apple and, and some other partners. Uh, we uh, use Jam for mobile device management. Uh, CDW is a huge partner for us for getting devices uh, actually out to the campuses and into the hands of students. And so we continue to work with those partners. We're also partnering now. Um, Microsoft's one of our key partners uh, because we also have a standard Microsoft device as part of the uh, success program that uh, is being available. So. And we're really looking for, for any other partners that are really Make interested pitch, man. in this. Make yeah. pitch. Well, you know, <laughs> hey, uh, in terms of the reach and what we're doing uh, in the CSU, I think the, the opportunity to serve that many students uh, in such a diverse system 
and CSU has a huge impact on social mobility in California, I think nationwide, based on the number of students that we graduate. Um, so, so having partners that are really interested in continuing to work in the space, you know, and, and it's not just around devices, it's really again, again around removing those access barriers. Right. So what are some of those other access barriers? Well, we know broadband access. I was just saying, just, just getting online. That's that's a huge part of it. And so we, we also have uh, partnered with uh, AT&T and T-Mobile uh, through the program to, to uh, provide uh, broadband, uh, mobile broadband access through the program. That's been a, a great partnership as well. Um, and we're continuing to really look for whatever opportunities we can to Sort of check things off, uh, check things off the list. Uh, virtual computer labs, uh, lab virtualization. Uh, another, you know, people don't necessarily think of that as a, a technology or equity issue, but you know, being able to access computing resources from anywhere, not necessarily having to come to a physical space on campus during specific hours. Uh, where you know, if you're a non-traditional student or maybe an adult learner, that might be extremely difficult to do. So, you know, there there are, I think, a lot of, of opportunities that are related to this that we're still looking for. Wow, I just, I'm, 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 there's about 700 questions I can still ask, but I feel like you need to ask you. Right. What? So, so what's next? I, actually, before we do that, what's failed? What hasn't? You know, I like. Certain, certain, you know, certain individuals you know, just never kind of caught and see the program, devices failed, partnerships ignored, you know, what, what, what? I don't know if I would characterize anything as a failure at this point. We're just learning as we know. But one of the, you asked about feedback that we got in some of There was a really deep conversation around kind of the language that you use for access efforts. So, you know, some parallel examples of the campus might be like, how do you destigmatize um, access to the business? So, again, it's like, how do you create a device longer program? So, there's a stigma attached to the business, and you start to have to reveal private information in order to get the things that it's really a success effort and not a, you know, doesn't have any negative decisions that they want to have to make sure. And so, I think that's something that we can be more thoughtful about. Any, any, uh, like before we, you know, I ask my, my usual closing. Any innovation that's come out of this? Any, again, I don't want to say an, an aha in the data, but sort of an unusual partnership has come out of maybe the students have been working on it. A discovery in how they're, you know, how they're accessing campuses or how they're able to access internet or you know, any sort of talk about the CSSA partnership. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we have uh, essentially what's uh, our student government, what's known as CSSA, uh, and it's run by again students, comprised of all of our uh, of all the campuses, and it's been really uh, interesting because they really latched onto this program because obviously they want to champion something that benefits the students and that they can visually see an effect, right? And um, the partnership has been incredible, and I don't know that I I do think that we intentionally wanted to work with them but the fact that the level of uh championship that they they took themselves to really spearhead this and to want to talk with others about it so they uh, they, they talked to other divisions they talked to student affairs to, to uh, couple it with our uh, food pantries and I, I think that uh, it was a partnership that we were really excited to see because how many times in it do you get an opportunity to really sit down one-on-one -on -one with students day to day Sometimes you don't you don't get that opportunity as often as you'd like, and so this was really something that uh, allowed us to collaborate at another level. Go ahead. I just wanted to add to something that Mike said uh, in the student partnership with Basic Needs because I think this is what this has brought to light is uh, what we've experienced with the pandemic, how much this kind of technology access is really a basic needs issue. And incorporating that into the the language that we have around basic needs. And, and leveraging those partnerships, I think, is really, really important. And I think will be continue to be important 
to uh, us being able to reach you. Right. So, final question: Any mimickers? Any any uh, copycat programs? Anybody else saying? Hey, sorry I mean, you, about that. You have a huge ecosystem. You've got a huge. You know, you are the eyes are on in a lot of ways. Is that state system is Wyoming doing this? Is Idaho doing this? Is, well, I'm saying I'm going to say we're trying to copy from some of the best, and I think some of the best we have. We have some campuses in our system are doing this really well. And we know there are other uh, there are other systems that are uh, working on equity initiatives that are, that are similar. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones that come to mind. I want to say uh, University of Kentucky was one that I think we looked at. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, that was I think inspiration for us. We try to Super steal cool. from the best as yeah. well. Yeah. I know um, Ohio State was also doing something similar. We collaborated with them a lot on, on some of the work that they've done. It's really unique. It, uh, is that, you know, I, I think the real benefit of higher ed is that you get to collaborate, right? And it's not seen as like a real life. No, it's not competition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they shared uh, findings with us, and we shared findings that we've seen. And so it, it's benefited our students, and that's what we're going to do. So. Mike Provenos, Peter Mosinski, and Kate Green. Thank you so much for your time today. Looking forward to Friday 9 a.m. Come to check out your presentation here at EduCause. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks again for joining me for the eLearn podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Just, just push subscribe on your player right now. And remember, you can join the conversation live on YouTube, Facebook, and my LinkedIn feed every week. I hope to see you there. Thanks.